here looks for a single issue that we think deserves the attention of all of North Carolina, all geographies, all sectors, all political ideologies, something that we think will either make or break the state going forward. And this year, it should come as no surprise to anyone, we're focused on the role that world-class teachers play, not just in our students' lives, but in the shaping of the future of our state. So coming up in February of 2014, we're going to host the Emerging Issues Forum, which will focus on teachers and the great economic debate. But before then, we've spent some time going across the state of North Carolina, trying really hard to understand what you all think world-class teachers are, what they do, what the distinguishing features may be. This is the first in a series of webinars that focuses on these questions. What we've heard from groups across the state is when you think of a world-class teacher, you're thinking of an innovator, a learner, driver, facilitator, advocate, and collaborator. The reality for all of us is that world-class teachers know what's going on inside the classroom and outside the classroom and recognize that their roles in supporting their students take them far beyond the school walls. Interestingly, at the same time that the Institute for Emerging Issues was trying to figure out the role of a worst class teacher, the entire nation was gripped with some high profile stories of students who were struggling with mental health, mental behavior challenges. And there were calls for a national conversation to increase understanding about mental health. The president himself responded to these national calls, directing the U.S. Departments of Health and Human Services and Education to launch a national dialogue on mental health, focusing on school age youth. It became clear to us here at IEI that there was an opportunity to participate in this national dialogue from the standpoint of examining the role of world-class teachers in classrooms and focusing on mental health. The purpose of today's webinar is to discuss the policies and practices needed to increase the number of elementary school children with a mental health or behavioral issue who actually receive appropriate and early care. We're very hopeful that this is the beginning of a conversation and that through this webinar, we will spark your best ideas for improving North Carolina's current mental health system. Through the remainder of this month, both of us here at the Institute for Emerging Issues are going to invite you to share your ideas for making our system better, more productive, more supportive of our children and more supportive of the teachers who seek to serve them. We're going to ask you to place those ideas in our Emerging Issues Commons, which is a virtual collaboration space where you can listen to the stories of North Carolina, explore county level data across four issue areas, share your own ideas, and then, of course, comment on and rank the ideas of others. This is a really cool interactive space where we hope to spark ideas that bubble up from communities and begin to inform statewide policies and programs. The ideas that generate the most support from those of you who participate will be submitted to the National Dialogue on Mental Health and just as a little bit of extra incentive, the author of what is the most compelling idea will receive a free registration to this year's Emerging Issues Forum. Actually, I should say next year's Emerging Issues Forum since we're looking at February of 2014. Shortly after this webinar, you will receive an email from our health policy manager, Sarah Langer, giving you all of the details on how you can participate in this con ongoing conversation. And I really encourage you to make it a robust one. Now, with the preliminaries out of the way, let me go on to the meat of this webinar and why you are all here to participate. Participants have all been muted to avoid echo on the call, but when it is their turn to make a presentation, we will unmute them. Of course, if the presentation goes way over, we'll just mute them again. Just kidding, just kidding. We'll take questions from those of you who are participating in the webinar after we hear from all of our presenters. Please feel free to ask any questions you may have using this chat feature on this webinar. If your question for some reason doesn't get answered this afternoon, we promise 
will get the answer back out to you and all the rest of the participants. And now, with that underway, let me turn things over to our moderator, William Lasseter. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, my computer has gone to sleep on me, so hopefully it will be back up in a second. But in the meantime, um, I want to welcome everybody this afternoon to our webinar. Um, it is a privilege for me to get to moderate the panel this afternoon. We have some wonderful um, guests that are on our panel. And this has become such a, a, a very important issue. Um, back in um, December of last year, we had the Sandy Hook incident, and that was right after the election of our now governor. And one of the first charges that our governor gave the new secretary of the Department of Public Safety was to look at this issue of school safety and how do we create safe school environment for our schools. And one of the first ways that we wanted to do that was by first creating a center for safer schools, which was done in March of last year. And that center um, was charged by the governor to go out and listen to folks in the field about what makes a school a safe place. And we did nine public forums across the state of North Carolina where we gathered input from um, parents and teachers and administrators and mental health professionals and found out what it is that they thought would make schools safer. This was done in um, April and May of last year. We had um, Dr. Matthews, who's on the panel today, was also joined us for many of those visits, and Sonia Brown, who's also um, on the call today, uh, on the webinar today, was uh, on many of those visits with us. We got a lot of great information, and one of the things that we heard over and over again is we want to work on this issue of school mental health. We heard about a, several great programs, one in Jackson County where mental health services are co-located on the school campus's grounds. Um, they do pro bono work with students on that school campus in exchange for an office space on the campus, and I thought it was a really unique idea. Um, and we heard about um, mental health first aid, which is a, a program that we're going to start providing to practitioners across the state through the Department of Health and Human Services. This Center for Safer Schools has continued by putting out a report in September to the governor that included 80 different recommendations for um, the legislator, for the governor, for the Department of Public Instruction, the Department of Public Safety, the Department of Health and Human Services, and also for stakeholders in the field about what we're, we're asking them to do to make schools safer across the state of North Carolina. This is a uh, a, a big initiative, and um, part of what's going to help guide that initiative is the new um, Governor's Task Force on School Safety, which um, Dr. Matthews is also a member of that task force that we'll hear from in a few minutes. And so there's a lot of initiatives that are going into this, and one of the steering committees that's going to be reporting back to that task force is on exact, this exact topic today. So we're looking forward to your input as um, members that are um, listening in on the the um, webinar today, but we're also, I'm very interested in hearing what our panelists have to say about this very important issue of school mental health. So to start the conversation today, we're going to have um, Dr. Golden, um, who's an associate professor at the Department of Psychology at East Carolina University, who um, romped our wolf pack this weekend. That's that's okay. We won't hold that against Dr. Golden. Um, but if she can give us a, a, a overview of kind of what this issue is all about as far as school mental health and how prevalent um, school mental health problems are, especially among um, our youth today that are in our schools, so that stakeholders in the field can kind of understand what are we exactly dealing with. So she's going to give us a, a good overview of that um, to start out with. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Golden. All and right. Then, thank you. Don't mind me interrupting, um, Dr. Golden. If you'll just remember to say next slide when you'd like us to change your okay. PowerPoint, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Next slide. All right. The prevalence um, estimates go anywhere from about 20 percent to about 36 percent of uh, children have some kind of mental health disorder, which means in your classroom you might have anywhere from one in five to one in three kids that actually have a mental health disorder. As you can see, ADHD tops the list, and this is twice as likely um, for boys as girls, um, but girls are twice as likely to suffer from a mood disorder. Advance the slide, please. Um, a huge problem we're dealing with now is autism. The estimates of autism are uh, rising every year, and um, again, the prevalence rates are about four times higher um, for boys than for girls. Advance the slide, please. 
Um, one study that found that about 36 percent of those children tested had at least one psychiatric disorder said that certain disorders increase over time like social anxiety and depression whereas others like ADHD as children get over tends to decline. Next slide please. Um, one of the things we know is that early treatment is extremely important. In fact, in autism, even as young as two years old or immediately upon diagnosis. 50% um, of all mental health disorders begin in childhood. And there are typically long delays before uh, children receive treatment. And unfortunately, untreated mental health disorders can lead to more severe disorders, they're more difficult to treat, and they also then have co-occurring disorders. Next slide, please. Um, coupled with this is that it's very difficult to identify and get kids into treatment so that only about 20 percent of those that have those disorders are identified and receive those services and they usually receive them in schools. Next slide, please. Um, why mental health disorders are so hard to recognize is that the age group norms um, are difficult because kids develop so rapidly and at different rates. Also, young children are not able to often verbalize how they think or how they feel if they're depressed or if they're anxious, and so they do not recognize the problem. Usually the ones we recognize are the externalizing disorders, the ones like ADHD, conduct disorder, oppositional disorder, which cause problems to teachers and other peers. And also, symptoms look different in children from how they look in adults. And it's kind of complex that sometimes children outgrow problems. Other times, if you don't do something, they become a lot more serious and they last for a very long time. Next slide, please. Um, I have listed a lot of the symptoms of anxiety disorder. Next slide. Um, depression. Next slide. And all of those, both of those are your internalizing disorders. And a lot of times people with uh, kids with depression and anxiety, again, it doesn't necessarily get recognized because they don't tend to cause problems in school. But the externalizing disorders, such as ADHD, here are some of the um, symptoms. Next slide, please. Um, here are the symptoms of, of oppositional defiant disorder. Next slide and the symptoms of conduct disorder. These are the kids that really get noticed and they're what we call externalizing disorders. Um, next slide, please. Um, but what we do know is early intervention is the most effective. We should begin in preschool and we also know that preventive interventions where we look at the at-risk factors and the protective factors rather than waiting until they become full-blown behavior problems or diagnosed as mental disorders. Next slide, please. The most important thing you can do to treat externalizing disorders is to create positive changes in the school and the home environment. In other words, we can't just take the child into an office one-on-one -on -one and treat a child for mental health disorders. We have to include the teacher, the family, the home and school relationship, the schools and the neighborhoods all have to be part of mental health treatment. Next slide. And what we find is that reinforcement by significant others in the child's life, reinforcement by parents and teachers, does a lot more to promote self-control in children and pro-social behavior in children than any type of social skills training. I think a lot of times what we want to do is we want to get the child in a group or get them individually and teach them new skills. But those skills will not emerge in the natural environment unless we get teachers and parents to reinforce those skills. And the things that we have found in the literature that are the most effective are enthusiastic praise from parents and excitement over appropriate behavior. Oftentimes parents and teachers get excited about inappropriate behavior and that only makes the behavior occur more. What we need to do is get excited about appropriate behavior. We need to give it positive attention, token systems, points, behavioral contracts are very effective. The good behavior game has been shown to cause long-term effects when they start doing that in young children in um, uh, preventing delinquency later in life.
Dr. Goldman, we appear to have lost you for a second. We can see you talking, but we're unable to hear you. Could you pause for a second for us, please? Let's figure out what how, the technical How about is. now? Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you just fine. Okay. Okay. So anyway, um, we had a family fair where we had activities for families with kids together, and we got uh, parents and kids doing fun activities and winning prizes. And I did a presentation about the excitement technique, which is praising appropriate behavior. And I got a spontaneous email from a grandma and a mother who had an 18-month-old little boy, Nicholas, who wouldn't eat. And so she was uh, trying to use one of my techniques, the mom and the grandma. And they told him that he could go see the chickens. He loves to see the chickens if he would eat three bites. Well, they used the excitement technique, which is praising, getting excited, clapping their hands. And they said he ate and ate much more than three bites. I have to tell you that I loved watching your methods work like last night and today. It's very close to magic. But my point in using this example is this is a preventive approach. This is an 18-month-old child who is just starting to have some problems. But by changing the behavior of getting the parent and the grandmother to reinforce the appropriate behavior and the behavior they want, this will help the child not to have problems later in life. And this is a perfect example of prevention, dealing with at-risk um, factors, and um, getting parents and teachers to change their behavior in order to help the child. So I hope I made it in my 10 minutes. <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, we did, and we counted the time against you that you muted yourself. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> did you miss any of what I said, or did I, I think get it? I think we got the gist of okay. it. I think that's yeah. where you had ended. Okay. Back to you, you, William. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Golden. Uh, we appreciate it. And um, I love the, the, the chicken story, um, having a, a family that had some chickens. So that's a, a great way. And we always talk about how, you know, too often kids know how to get attention, and that attention is only through bad behavior. So I really like what you, you were talking about by using techniques like the token system or giving them rewards, how that can affect um, changing behavior. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, next, we'll have Dr. Ben Matthews from the Department of Public Instruction that's going to give us an overview of what the Department of Public Instruction is doing to address this issue. He's um, the director of this new division that um, has, has been created that has joined a couple of different divisions. And so, um, Dr. Matt Matthews, if you'll give us an overview of how your department's working on this particular issue. And I just want to thank you publicly for all the support that you gave the Center for Safer Schools when we were starting up and helping us go out and do all these public forums to get input on how do we create safer schools across the state. So thank you for that and please tell us what the Department of Public Instruction is doing to address this issue. Uh, next slide please. Uh, thanks a bunch Billy, I really appreciate that and I also want to do a quick shout out to Anita Brown Graham and the Emerging Issues Forum. I've been going to those Anita I know for the past 24 years and they're just absolutely wonderful. Also, thanks a bunch, Sarah, for working with us to get this together. And Billy, thanks to you. We we absolutely appreciate the uh, collaboration with you and the Center for Safer Schools and the General Assembly direct us, directed us to work together. And they didn't really need to do this because we were already doing it. But um, I, I think we're going to make some really great inroads here. Uh, the slide that you see in front of us now is really one of the most important things for the Department of Public Instruction and that is to see that our, we're making progress with education in North Carolina. And one of the attributes related to that is graduation rates. And one of the things that we know is related to the graduation rate is our school support teams, which I'll talk about as we progress, and what they have to do to lead to this historical accomplishment. Next slide. Our school support teams are made up of these people, counselors, nurses, psychologists, resource officers, and social workers. Um, in 2013, our legislat legislators has direct, have directed our guidance counselors. I mean, this is a really mind-boggling idea, but that guidance counselors probably should be doing guidance counseling. So they directed them to use a minimum of 80% of their time to be directly related to that service and not be doing testing and other things that, that um, their profession had been diluted by. Uh, we also had professional standards passed by the State Board of Education for our school support teams in 2009. And in 2013, evaluation instruments were added, and those are now in place. So these people doing those, this most effective work are being 
supported by a system that evaluates their outcomes. Next slide. One of the really exciting things now that we've seen are the uh, support for our school resource officers. And one of the things that I learned, Billy mentioned the nine uh, places we were at, went around the state this past spring, and I learned something very valuable. I really saw the value of school resource officers on that trip. Um, in 1996, we had 236 resource officers. In 2013, we had 1460, 1,460. And the most recent General Assembly gave us $7 million to provide more school resource officers for elementary and middle schools across North Carolina. And as of this morning, I just gave Billy the statistics just a moment ago, uh, it looks like approximately 5 million of that 7 million will be allocated this coming month to, at, at this point, 41 LEAs, that's local education agencies in North Carolina, and five charter schools have applied for those monies. So we're going to get more feet on the ground to assist with this across North Carolina. Next slide. One of the things that we know is so important is to get support for our kids. And very quickly here, this basically just shows, and one of the things is very, I also sit on the Child Fatality Task Force uh, for the state, and we have seen an uptick in suicides in middle school kids. And so we want to be sure that we're doing everything we possibly can in the mental health arena to preclude such behaviors. Next slide. We've seen, um, this shows where we are with the uh, measurement of mental health issues in our kids across North Carolina, elementary, middle, and high school. 2011, 10, 11, we had 12,903 total. We did see a little downturn on that on 2011-12. Uh, the good news is we saw a drop in the high school, um, and, and we we're seeing a little bit uh, a rise in the elementary school, so that's a, a concern for us. And Dr. Golden mentioned getting to kids early and that's, this, this shows us that we really need to be doing that. Uh, very quickly, next slide. One of, one of the attributes that we're using across the schools are, is the uh, Positive Behavior Intervention and Support Program, which helps create a climate to provide good behavioral support in our schools, which leads to academic success. Next slide. We're also looking at a Response to Intervention, RTI. It's a multi-tier approach to early identification, again, supporting what Dr. Gold said, Golden said about looking and, and getting support to kids quickly who have needs. Uh, next slide. Another piece related to this is our individual education plans, which give, are given to special needs kids in our state, and they can be totally targeted for a particular aspect of kids' behavior and can look at mental health issues when appropriate and be sure that we get everyone working together to assist to get better outcomes for these students. Next slide. One of the really exciting things that I have, now, I have sitting across the table for me today, Chris Menard, our allied health consultant who is the uh, lead author of the thing I'm getting ready to speak to you about, but something that we're really excited about. And Dr. Golden again alluded to the need for this in identifying uh, only 20% of our kids in, in across our state who need mental health support. We, uh, Chris, and along with a team of people across North Carolina, put together modules that our regular classroom teachers in pre-K through 12 can have an understanding student behavior. By monitoring student behavior, we hopefully can determine kids who need additional mental health support and get that for them in our schools. And to me, that is this is extremely exciting. And another thing, an even more exciting piece of that, since this was introduced just this past spring, uh, over 7,000 teachers and school staff people have gone online and taken this training. So we're really excited about that. Another exciting piece of this is that we're going to do the same thing for school resource officers, and we should have that available in 2014. And this is another thing that Chris is leading along with a group of folks to um, provide this training for our school resource officers. So that tells us that we would have a tremendous um, feet on the ground support for identifying student behavior, which could um, get us in a position to help them if they have mental health issues. 
We're also working, uh, next slide please, we are working, and Jeannie, Dr. Golden and I talked about this earlier, we um, are, are working with Dr. Kurt Michael and a team of Appalachian State to get other state agencies in mapping mental health out across our state for our K-12 students. And Dr. Michael, who is a professor at uh, Appalachian State, and we also in a consortium with the University of South Carolina. Uh, we went up and worked with them this summer, and we're trying to move this out across with a, a North and South Carolina consortium to provide such support for our schools. So a lot of exciting things on the public school front, and I'm really looking forward, Billy, to the task force this coming week meeting, the Governor's Task Force on Safer Schools, to really get some of the ideas from the great report that you and Kim and others wrote over there in your center out and across our state. All right. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. We, we appreciate the update from DPI. Um, as you can see, uh, DPI has got a lot of new initiatives and some initiatives that are out there that people probably just don't know about that um, we're trying to raise awareness about also. And the uh, modules that Chris um, Menard has, has developed um, on school resource officers are excellent. Um, so if you guys have not seen a chance, had a chance to look at those modules, I would highly recommend those. And one of the things that Dr. Matthews had in his slide that he was just talking about is that reduction in juvenile crime. And talking from the juvenile crime side of, of, of things, that's something that we, we view as a, a very positive. We've reduced the number of kids that are being served in our youth development centers by almost 75 percent over the last decade. Yes, that's really exciting. Thank you for catching that, Billy. Yeah. and and. But what does that mean? Um, that means that 75% of kids are now in our communities, in our schools, and you guys on the front lines, uh, uh, and we're going to hear from somebody from the front lines in just a second, um, Ms. Sheila uh, Caraway from um, West Green Elementary School, who was the Teacher of the Year last year at West Green, um, is going to tell us kind of the front line perspective from a teacher, because we know that these kids with um, really tough issues a lot of times are still being served in their communities, which is a great thing because the research shows that that is more effective, but it does cause challenges for schools and for teachers, and we're really interested in that frontline perspective. So, um, Ms. Caraway, if you could take it away and kind of tell us about how you've done that at your school and how you've built those relationships and overcome some of these, these challenges at a school level. Okay. Um, I have found that over my 27 years in the teaching career that to help a child with uh, behavior issues or mental health issues that it's all about having a relationship with them. You gotta have a relationship with a child before you can help them. I think it's also very important to before you can um, reach them you gotta have a relationship with their parents. You gotta have a relationship with the school support team, your administration, you all have to have that relationship in order to work best for that child. You know, I have found that you got to have that solid, healthy relationship and one that is built on trust. If they do not trust you, they know it. You don't, you don't fool them. They know if you are on their side. They know if you are for them. I've always believed and I have said that kids don't learn from people they don't like. And I also believe that kids don't open up and share their inner world if they don't like you. They will not share with you. I also believe that a successful teacher, that they care about all the needs of their student, not just the academic needs, but their social and their uh, emotional needs. That is, that's a part of that whole child. And I feel like that I know my kids better than anyone when they are in my classroom is home away from home and I spend more awake hours as I tell my students and so we really get to know each other. 
I do feel that if a child, not only with me being the teacher, but I feel like that every child should have somebody when they walk in the doors of the school each day that they know is on their side, whether that person is the principal, the janitor, the music teacher, whoever, they know that they have one person that is on their side each day when they enter the school building. I do also feel that once you are engaged with that child and you have a relationship with them, that you've also got to have a relationship with there? Yeah, we lost you for a second, but I think you're back. Okay. That um, you, you've got to have a relationship with the parents also. They have to the parents have to know that you care about their child. They need to know that it's not just words that you say, but it's in action. And they also have to know that they can trust you as long with the student. Um, I feel that the better the relationship with the parent, the more open communication that you're gonna get. When a child is in your room and you are noticing that things are not going well or things are not normal, then if you do have a relationship with that parent, a phone call, just getting in contact with them, a lot of times it might be a five minute conversation and you can find out some things that might be going on at home. But you gotta have that relationship there first. I do feel that West Green, my school, has made great strides in supporting the students here with the mental health and behavior issues as well as all the students. I feel like that we have really um, reached out in the community and we have brought our school environment in the community and I'll get to that in just a minute. But our district created in 2006, we created a care coordination team and that is made up of uh, two administrators and a counselor, the school nurse and the school social worker. And once a referral has been made by the teacher, then this care coordination team, they meet once a week to determine how they will meet the needs of these students that are at risk. That has definitely been a major link from them helping us, the classroom teacher. And we also have a child family support team and that is made up of uh, a social worker and the school nurse and they have also been a great connection with the classroom teacher, the parents, and the student. And they have helped a lot with helping us to be able to make contact with parents that maybe normally we are not able to make contact with. And they visit these homes, they provide transportation and they are also there to help when the, a, crisis, a crisis um, is apparent and also when sometimes they just need to be there in the home to listen. I do, I was asked to speak about some of the challenges that um, I feel as a classroom teacher and one of the challenges is 
we we still each day have to work with that communication with those parents and it is something that i feel does not start the first day of school i feel like it should start before the first day i feel like if it is calling that family welcoming their child I also feel that our economy, our high unemployment rates has played a major, has been a major impact on our mental health issues and behavior issues because when parents don't have transportation or if there is little food in the home, kids have a lot of anxiety about this and this causes a lot of mental health issues uh, we did have in our county as most of you already know we did have uh in 99 we had floyd which when the floor the, the floods that had a tremendous impact on our kids and then in 2011 when we had the tornado we had a lot of kids that were displaced and we had a lot of mental health attention that was needed after these two major events. I do know that my school is doing very well. Um, one area that um, has been a major impact has been the mental health agencies in our county. They do have approval now that they come in and they will talk with me and they will talk with the child. So that has been great to have them to come in on site in the school and talk with the teacher, the student, the support staff and the administration. Also, um, the the mental health agents. Miss Carraway. Yes. We actually have a couple of questions for you on okay. exactly how you might be working with mental health agencies. So I'm wondering if we could pause on you for a second okay. and go to our final presenter and then get to those questions. That will William, be I'm going to pass it back to you. Is that, that fine? Great. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Ms. Carraway, and um, thank you for your service that you do every day for, for our young people across the state of North Carolina. We greatly appreciate it. Um, coming from a, a family of educators, I know how difficult the job is many days, and we appreciate what you do. Um, next, we want to hear from Anita Herring, who is actually a parent, um, and um, I, we, we really wanted to get her perspective also of having um, a, a child um, in the system, and if you'll just give us kind of uh, overview of your experience and what it's been like to, to work through the, the mental health issues and also with, this, with um, this, the school support team in your area. Okay, um, my, I do have a son that I want to talk a little bit about that is, uh, did just graduate from high school this year, but when he was in elementary school, um, we had, uh, we knew there were some things going on with him both behaviorally and uh, mentally. And with the experience we had with his school, um, it was very difficult. It was, um, we were constantly battling with his teacher. And we're an open book. We have no shame in our children, you know, having mental health issues or whatnot. And we always talk to the teacher, you know, before, um, in the beginning, so that we could build that relationship. And his fifth grade teacher when we went in and spoke to her and said we want to know you know if his behavior changes because he's on all this medication you know and uh she says oh all denzel needs is just a little more love so that was her answer to his mental health issues uh, long story short with him we we battled all year and um between fifth and sixth grade, he ended up in the juvenile justice system. So we had 
kind of a negative experience there and I just tell you that because if you as teachers if you have parents that are willing to actually open up to you to listen um, listen and watch make notes um, you know just just to just to keep the parent abreast because I personally don't think he should have ever ended up in the juvenile justice system and I do not blame it on the schools or the teachers at all he had a lot of issues but I think if they would have stepped up and listened and helped us and not battled us during his IEP meetings and not wanting to do this service and that service for him I think I think that may have <clears throat> excuse me may have helped keep him out Luckily, fast forward to high school, his teachers in Moore County were excellent. You know, they knew how to handle his ADHD. They would give him errands to run when he wouldn't sit down in the classroom. And he did. He graduated from high school and he just finished a lineman course through like a technical community college. So he did well. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about my daughter. She's the youngest one here. And with her, we had really positive experiences. Um, I was worried in the beginning because of all the trouble we had with my son. I thought, oh gosh, here we go again. We have this young child. However, I, I found that when you speak to the teachers, nine times out of 10, they're gonna know somebody or have a family member that maybe has a mental health issue. And with her kindergarten teacher, her teacher had um, an anxiety disorder. My daughter had an anxiety disorder. She started um, when she was four, her brother left the home, and so there was trauma there. She suffered a childhood trauma. When she was seven, her dad deployed to Afghanistan, and she was convinced that he was going to die and never come home. So she detached. And to this day, she, she you know, she, they're still trying to build a relationship. Um, she's still young, so there's hope. Um, but really what I'm getting at is his, her teachers were, were wonderful. They kept in touch with me. They wrote notes. They called me. Uh, my daughter had a habit in the first uh, kindergarten, first, second grade of um, having accidents all the time because her nerves would get so bad. And so what the teacher and I did is I would send a couple little backpacks to school each Monday and if my daughter had an accident, instead of making a big deal about it, she would hand her her bag and tell her to go to the restroom and change. And I think that helped her get through. Um, and that knowledge is power. And I would go in and I would talk to her teachers and say, okay, she has this or her father's gone and, you know, she's, she lost. And I said this, she lost her mind because she just, couldn't cope and couldn't, you know, uh, function. And um, so that that's kind of where we stand with that. I've been very happy. And I just wanted to talk about my son to show you that things do change. And although his elementary school um, wasn't what we had hoped, the high school here in North Carolina, I was very pleased with. And like I said, my daughter's elementary school, every teacher she had up to the fourth grade has been just wonderful, wonderful to us and for her. And I think it's changed um, her outlook on school. It's changed her outlook on family, on friends, and, and just life in general. You know, she no longer wants to die. She no longer just wants to crawl in a hole and not talk to anybody. So I will say that uh, we've had good experiences with her mental health issues with the school. Thank Great you. to hear. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Anita. Uh, your experience is, is invaluable, and you know, from a kid that grew up with a um, disability myself, uh, being albino and having poor vision, I know that having that support structure at home is just invaluable. So thank you for what you did for your kids. I know that. Okay, I'm in learning too. Thanks. Um, I did want to thank. Oh. Go ahead, please, William. Okay. Uh, I did want to thank a couple other people that um, are joining us today. Um, one is Chris Menard, and we've talked about her already. Um, Chris works with Dr. Matthews over at uh, DPI. He's join she's joining us today. Um, Jennifer um, Rothman from um, NAMI um, is joining us today. 
Um, Sonia Brown from the Department of Health and Human Services, their mental health um, section um, is joining us. And Stephanie Daniels, who's the Executive Director of the School Health Alliance in um, Forsyth County is joining us. And we also have um, Dr. Kurt Michaels, who is from Appalachian State University, um, been helping us with several different projects. And um, if we have time, Anita, um, I think Dr. Michaels has a quick little um, presentation he wants to talk to us about about mapping that he's done with um, okay. with mental health. And um, I've, I've seen this before, and it's, it's very valuable if we have time to do it. Uh, William, I'm sorry. Apparently, he is not on with us okay. right now. Um, I do actually have a couple of questions that I'd like to try okay. to go to, if that's okay with you. Perfect. Um, one of them is actually for Chris Menard. Um, there are a cluster of questions, and I'm just going to put them all out at the same time, about school resource officers. So one question, which you should absolutely expect given the presentation, is whether it's too late to apply for money for a school resource officer, and if not, how does one go about replying to do, applying for one? And then the other question that I'd love to have some response to really focuses on the fact that, the, that there's an assumption that we use SROs to react to violence, but more and more all of us are hearing about some really effective prevention that's being done by SROs, and can we talk some a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, I would jump in. Billy, is that okay? Absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, uh, no, it is not too late to for the school districts or um, charter schools to apply for these grants. The deadline is December the 12th. And you can go online to uh, the Department of Public Instruction's website or go to www.schoolclearinghouse, that's all one word, dot org, and look in the publication section and you will see the application process for the school resource officers. So no, it's not too late, and yes, we would love for you to apply. Um, Billy may want to jump in on this too, but what, one of the things that we're seeing with the school resource officers is a strengthened relationship between them, the law enforcement community who they represent, and our students in our schools. And kids are building relationships with them and understanding the value of working with a law enforcement person uh, rather than just seeing them as a police person or a highway patrol person. They also work as a liaison between the law enforcement community and the school system. They answer questions. They assist our kids. One of the things that we heard when we traveled around the state was how helpful kids thought their SROs were in dealing with many, many issues. Uh, counseling issues and re referring them to counselors, helping them with legal issues that really had nothing to do with schools. It had nothing to do with violence. Uh, it had to do with just having someone, an advocate in the law enforcement community to help them out. Um, the school resource officers have been trained to be mentors to the kids, to listen to the kids. And one of the things we heard over and over across the state was that kids, and, and Dr. Golden alluded to this, and the sport support that kids need in the adult community. One of the things Billy heard me say this ad nauseum is we're all in this together. And it, uh, school violence, school mental health, mental health period is in relationship to all people surrounding us. And so our kids need adults. Uh, not only in their homes, but in the community to support them. And SROs play uh, a significant role in that process. So um, those are a few of the things that are out there for the, the school resource. There are a lot more, but there's uh, not enough time to go into all of it. And, and I would just um, add, Dr. Matthews, that with, with the prevention side, we, we've looked at it, and school resource officers really play three roles. They play the law-related educator role, the law-related counselor role, and of course the law enforcement officer role on that school campus. But I, it, it kind of goes back to what um, Sheila was saying with relationships. Those yes. officers that form those good relationships with students, guess what? Students are more likely to speak up when a crisis is going to occur on yes. campus or a kid's going to bring a weapon on school campus, and they report those things to, law, to that school resource officer because they trust them. And um, you know, 
that that is just a huge piece of it. And, and Sheila probably said it so eloquently when she was talking about how it's important for teachers, but it's so important for that school resource officer too. If they're truly going to be a force of change and prevention on that school campus, they've got to build those relationships with those students and staff members on that campus and get in, in, involved in the culture of an educational environment which is very different than what they're used to in a law enforcement culture. Absolutely. So I realize that we have two um, minutes left and several questions to go. Um, Ms. Carraway, you know, we've spent quite a bit of time trying to define a world-class teacher, and it strikes me that if we could just walk around with your picture and show a little clip from your video, we wouldn't have to try to define it because it's all about what you're doing and the focus on relationships and being willing to hear parents, to recognize when something is amiss with your students. I mean, it's the sort of stuff that we heard Ms. Heron saying made the difference in her experience for her children. And I wanna personally thank you for what you're doing for the children in Green County. Thank you. I wanna thank all of you for being with us this afternoon. Uh, this is a difficult subject to try to cover in an hour. I suspect that people are still left with lots of questions about what are the resources that exist, the resources for children, but also what are the resources that exist for teachers so that when they see signs, they know exactly how to respond to those signs. And I'm going to volunteer Sarah, who's uh, sitting across the table from me, smiling because she doesn't know what I'm going to volunteer her for quite yet, um, to really spend some time seeing if we can't put together some resources that are helpful to parents, to students, to teachers across North Carolina who are struggling to figure out what the resources are to support them. Uh, Sarah is giving me a note, so I'm going to reach across and get this. Oh, she's adding the link uh, uh, to the website, so she's already on top of it, which, you know, now it's not nearly as much fun because I think we get to look better. Um, we want to continue this conversation about the amazing role that we ask our teachers to play in sometimes identifying when something is wrong, but certainly always supporting the family and trying to find resources to be responsive. I hope all of you are planning to join us. Um, ben, if you've been to about 24 Emerging Issues Forums, no reason to stop now. We're looking forward I've to it. I've already registered. Yay, love it. I hope all of you will plan to be with us on February 10th and 11th as we get the state of North Carolina to really focus in on this question of what it is we are asking of our teachers and how we need to support them so that they can deliver on those expectations. There will be more webinars in this series. We've got one coming up on December 2nd, which is going to focus on comparing teachers internationally. We're going to feature Erke Loima from the University of Helensky, Yu Wang, Director of the English Department, ESL, teacher in the Beijing Royal Foreign Language School, Lynn Homayer, Educator and Membership Support Coordinator, National Public Education Support Fund. The challenges we've got here in North Carolina aren't just U.S. challenges, they're global challenges. And there are some countries that are probably a bit ahead of us in figuring out how they equip their teachers to meet those challenges. I hope we're all open ears and ready to learn from some of those experiences. Again, let me thank all of you for being with us. Let me thank the many people who are two days out from Thanksgiving participating in this webinar. We'll get back to you with that link on the Emerging Issues Commons and look forward to a continued conversation about what is, for sure, one of the most important issues confronting North Carolina today. With that, thank you all and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not without you.